In this lesson, we will prove the cauchy gorsaw theorem. In the last lesson, we saw that if a continuous function f has an antiderivative in a domain d, then the integral of f around a closed contour c line in d will equal zero. We will now prove the cauchy gorsaw theorem, which gives conditions on the function f that ensure that the integral of f around simple closed contours equals zero. But first we need to recall a fact from Calc 3 called Green's theorem. Suppose two real valued functions defined on the real plane, so real valued functions p of xy and q of xy, these are continuous functions in our region R and we're going to assume that their first order partial derivatives are also continuous. So we're going to assume that P and Q are continuous as well as their partial derivatives throughout the closed region capital R which consists of all points interior to and on a simple closed contour C. And Green's theorem says that the line integral over the contour C of P of xy dx plus Q of xy dy can be written as a double integral over the region R of function Q dx minus p dy so I'm going to use Green's theorem in the proof of the cauchy gorsaw theorem and a proof of Green's theorem can be found in most standard calculus texts. so now we're ready to state our main result the cauchy gorsaw theorem this theorem states that if a function f is analytic at all points interior to and on a simple closed contour C, then the integral of f over the contour c equals zero. So this theorem is named for Cauchy and Gorsaw. Cauchy was the first to prove this theorem, but in his proof he needed to assume that f prime was also continuous. Gorsaw was the first to prove this theorem without this extra condition. So now I'm going to present Cauchy's proof of this theorem because it's more intuitive and less technical than Gorsaw's proof. 
However, we'll have to use the additional assumption that f prime is continuous. So first, we need to assume that f prime is continuous. So we can use the Green's theorem in this proof. And let C denote a positively oriented simple closed contour. And let's assume we have the following parameterization of C. So Z of T equals X of T plus I Y of T for values of T between A and B. Then we have the contour integral of f along c, written parametrically as integral from a to b, f of z of t times z prime of t dt. And by writing f into its components u and v, we have that this equals integral from a to b. Now f is going to be u of x of t comma y of t plus i times v of x of t comma y of t. So here's this is f of z, z of t times z prime of t so times x prime of t plus i y prime of t dt. Now just doing the multiplication and combining the real and imaginary parts, we get that this can be written as the integral from a to b of the real part will be u times x prime minus v y prime dt plus i times the imaginary part, the integral from a to b of v x prime plus u y prime dt. And if we rewrite these as contour integrals, we see that this can be written as the integral over the contour c of u dx minus v dy plus i times integral over the contour c of v dx plus u dy. And now we're going to use Green's theorem on both the real and imaginary parts of this integral. So by Green's theorem, we can write this integral u dx minus v dy. So in Green's theorem, capital P will be equal to u and capital Q will be equal to negative v. And so I can rewrite this real part as the integral over the region R, where R is the interior of the contour C of negative dv dx minus du dy dx dy and likewise using Green's theorem on the imaginary part with capital P equal to V. So I'm rewriting this part capital P will be V and capital Q will be U. So we can write the imaginary part as the integral over the region R of du dx minus dv dy dx dy.
where R is the interior of the contour C. Now we're going to use the Cauchy Riemann equations and we see that since du dx equals dv dy we see that second integral will just be equal to zero and since we can write du dy as the negative of dv dx we get that the first integral, the real part, will also equal zero. So by the Cauchy Riemann equations we get the integral over the region r of zero dx dy plus i times the integral over the region r of zero dx dy. And of course the integral of zero is zero, so this equals zero. Which finishes the proof of the cauchy gorsaw theorem. So as an example of the power of this cauchy gorsaw theorem, we know that e to the z sine of z and z to a positive integer these functions are all entire analytic on the whole complex plane therefore the cauchy gorsaw theorem implies that for any simple closed contour C we have the integral of e to the c over the contour c equals zero. Likewise, the integral of sine of z dz over the contour c is zero. And the integral of z to the n equals zero. Since all of these functions are analytic inside and on the contour c. We don't have to parameterize contours anymore. We can just use the fact that these are analytic inside and on C, and the cauchy gorsaw theorem implies that these integrals will equal zero. So next we will look at the fact that the cauchy gorsaw theorem can be extended to multiply connected domains D that is domains that enclose points not in D so a simple, simply connected domain might look like this, where if you drew a simple closed contour in D, it would contain, it would enclose points only in D. So this is called a simply connected domain. A multiply connected domain might be like a region like this that has holes in it. So if we just look at the points on and around these holes, then we call such a domain a multiply connected domain. So the next theorem, we will extend the Cauchy-Gorsaw theorem 
to these types of multiply connected domains. So let's see C1, C2, all the way up to Cn be simple closed positively oriented contours with the properties that each of the CK lies interior to C and further the interior of CK has no point in common with the interior of CJ when K does not equal J now let F be an analytic function on all the contours and throughout the domain in between all of these contours so and throughout the multiply connected domain D between C and each of the contours CK. Then we can conclude that the integral of F along C will equal the sum k equals 1 to n of the integrals of f along the contour ck. So before we prove this, let me draw a sketch of this type of situation. So we have a contour c in the positive orientation and Inside C, there's little contours C1, C2, all the way up to Cn. And the domain D would be the region between all these contours. So F is analytic on all the contours C and C1 through Cn, and in between, then we'll show that the integral of F along the contour C is equal to the sum of the integrals along each of the CK. So let me first give a proof by picture. So we have the same region that I drew before what we're going to do is we're going to introduce polygonal paths. So the first polygonal path is going to be called L1 and it's going to join the contour C to C1 and then L2 is going to be a polygonal path that connects C1 to C2 and so on. We're going to continue until we have each one of these uh, little contours connected. So finally L n plus 1 will connect the contour cn to c. And then what we're going to do 
is break up the top and the bottom halves into two contours. The top contour I'm going to call gamma 1. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to traverse contour gamma 1. And we notice that as I traverse this contour, this contour will be traversed in the positive orientation. And notice that, that f is analytic on an interior to gamma 1, so the integral of f along gamma 1 will equal 0. Now gamma 2 will be the lower half, so again I'm going to traverse this contour in a around a region that is in a positive orientation and we see that F again is analytic inside and on the contour gamma 2 so the integral of F along gamma 2 also equals 0. So when we add these two integrals together we see that we traversed L1, all these polygonal, polygonal paths, in, in both directions. We, we, we traverse L1 from left to right and then from right to left. And so the integrals along those polygonal paths will cancel out. And notice that we traversed L1 in this direction. And then we traversed C in the opposite direction in the negative fashion. And, and so what we end up with is all the integrals along the polygonal paths will cancel out when we go back in the reverse direction. And all that's going to be left is the integral along the contour C when we add these two integrals together and the integrals along the little contours, but we're tra traversing these contours in the, in the negative fashion. This essentially will give us the formula that we wanted in the theorem. So there's a proof by picture. So let me write this up more formally. So to prove this theorem, we introduce a polygonal path. call it L1 consisting of a finite number of line segments joined end to end to connect the contour C, the outer contour C, to the inner contour and I'm going to write it as minus C1 so that would be C1 tra traverse in the in the clockwise direction and then Continue this way, then the polygonal path L2 will connect negative C1 to negative C2. Continue in this way. until the polygonal path L sub n plus 1 connects negative Cn to back to C. So we're going to traverse C1 in the clockwise direction, so this would be the contour negative C1. Again, L1 will be a polygonal path connecting C to negative C1. 
then we connect negative C1 to negative C2 with L2 and continue until finally L sub n plus 1 connects negative Cn to C. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to traverse two different contours called gamma 1 and gamma 2. So gamma 1 will be the, like the top half of this and gamma 2 will be the bottom half. So gamma 1 and gamma 2 are now simple closed contours and F is continuous on and interior to both these contours. So we will we'll traverse gamma 1 in this direction and then gamma 2 will be traversed also in the positive orientation. So when we come back in, we're going to be traversing these polygonal paths from right to left. And the point is when we add the integrals of f along these two contours, the integrals along these polygonal paths will cancel out. So we have created two simple closed contours gamma 1 and gamma 2 each consisting of polygonal paths LK, or if we want to traverse in the negative direction, it would be negative LK, and pieces of C and negative CK for each K. So since F is analytic on the interior and on the contours gamma 1 and gamma 2 by the cauchy grossau theorem, the integral of F over gamma 1 equals zero, and the integral of f over gamma two equals zero, so the sum of these integrals equals zero as well. Now, since the integrals in opposite directions along each of the, the polygonal paths LK will cancel out, so when we break up the sum of these integrals into the pieces, we see that the integrals in opposite directions along each of the polygonal paths LK will cancel and only the integrals along C and the negative CK will remain. Since the integrals in opposite directions along each polygonal path LK will cancel because they're traverse in one direction on gamma 1 and then traverse in the opposite direction along gamma 2 then in this sum of integrals only the integrals along C and the negative CK remain. So therefore, we have that zero equals the sum over gamma one of F plus the integral of F over gamma two 
And when we break this up into the pieces, we see that this equals the integral of f over c plus the sum of going from k equals 1 to n of the integral over the ck, the negative ck, that is, of f of z dz. So we see that this is equal to the integral of f over the contour c minus the sum k equals 1 to n of the integrals along each of the ck. So we just write the integral of f over negative ck as the negative of the integral of f over the ck. And by adding this sum to both sides of this equation, we get the desired equation with the integral of f over c equals the sum k going from 1 to n, the integrals of f over the contour ck. So a very useful corollary of this theorem occurs when we just consider the case when n equals 1. So that is when we just have one contour C1 inside a larger contour C. Corollary, which is a very useful corollary, and it's given the name the principle of deformation of paths. I'll explain that in a minute. So this is a useful fact, which is really just a restatement of the previous theorem when n equals 1. So let C1 and C2 denote positively oriented simple closed contours. where C1 is interior to C2. Now if F is an analytic function in the closed region consisting of C1 and C2, and the region between them, then we can conclude that the integral of f over c1 equals the integral of f over c2. Before we prove this, let's just draw a quick representation. So we have this larger contour C2. We have a, another contour C1 inside. And we know that F is, we're assuming that F is analytic in the region on and between C1 and C2. Then, just as we saw in the previous theorem, the integral around C1 will equal the integral around C2. So there's really no proof. So this is the case n equals 1 and the previous theorem. So the reason why this is called the principle of deformation of paths is because this re result enables us to replace integrals over a complicated contour with integrals that are more easily computed when C1 can be continuously deformed into C2, always passing through points at which F is analytic. So note this enables us to replace 
integrals over complicated contours with integrals over with integrals that are easy to compute when the interior contour C1 can be continuously deformed into the outer contour C2 always passing through points at which F is analytic. So imagine you had a contour of C1 that was just a circle. So circles have nice parameterizations. So if we had a circle line inside of C2, then we could evaluate the integral along C2 as the integral over a circle C1, as we'll see in the next example. So first, let's let C be any positively oriented simple closed contour surrounding the origin. So imagine we have the origin and C is any simple closed contour surrounding the origin. Then we're going to show that the integral of 1 over z over this contour C equals 2 pi i while The integral of 1 over z to the n over the contour c equals 0 for all integers other than 1. For all integers n not equal to 1. And the way we're going to do this is using the principle of deformation of path where we're going to choose a circle centered at the origin with radius r so that the contour C0 is contained entirely inside the contour C. So since the integrands are analytic on an interior to C and C0, the integral along C is equal to the integral along C0 by the principle of deformation of paths. So we're going to let C0 be the circle centered at the origin with radius r and we want the radius r to be so small that c0 lies entirely inside C. Then C0 is given by the parameterization C of t equals r e to i theta with theta between 0 and 2 pi. So we have C0 in the positive orientation to buy the uh, 
by the corollary above, the principle of deformation of paths, we have that the integral of 1 over z over c equals the integral of 1 over z over the contour c0. And using the parameterization, this is integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 over r e to the i theta. Now dz will be r i e to the i theta d theta. And so when we cancel the r e to the i theta, we just get i times integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta, which when evaluated equals 2 pi i. Likewise, the integral of 1 over z to the n over the contour c, the, the function 1 over z to the n will be analytic everywhere except at 0 when n is a positive integer. And when n is a negative integer, this function will be entire. So by the principle of deformation of paths, again, the integral of 1 over z to the n over c is equal to the integral over c0. And then using the parameterization, we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of r e to the i theta to the power n in the denominator. dz, again, will be r i e to the i theta d theta. And I could pull out an i. This is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. I'm going to get r to the power 1 minus n in the numerator and times e to the power 1 minus n times i theta d theta. And we can integrate this expression. So this is the integral will equal i times r to the 1 minus n e to the 1 minus n i theta divided by 1 minus n i evaluated at theta equals 2 pi and theta equals 0. So we have r to the 1 minus n. We can cancel an i in the numerator denominator divided by 1 minus n. And let's evaluate. So we get e to the 2 pi 1 minus n times i minus the evaluation at 0. So we get e to the 0. Well, e to an integer multiple of 2 pi, i just equals 1. So this equals r to the 1 minus n over 1 minus n times 1 minus e to the 0 is 1 and one minus one is, gives us zero.